Uh, today's presentation will be given by Nicola de Cosmo, who is the Henry Luce Foundation Professor of East Asian History at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. Uh, he joined the Institute faculty in 2003, before that taught at both Harvard and Canterbury in New Zealand. Uh, I will not uh, recite all of his publications, uh, but will only mention two titles. One is A Documentary History of Manchu-Mongol Relations, 1620, 1616 to 1626. And the second is an edited volume, Warfare in Inner Asia, 500 to 1800. So you notice there uh, two trends. The, you see him as the microhistorian, concentrating on one Im important decade, 1616 to 1626, and the macrohistorian covering the period of over a millennium, 500 to 1800. Today he will be in more in the macro mode, as I understand it, and will demonstrate to us that in addition to gunpowder, the Chinese also invented globalization. So please <laughs> welcome Nikola de Cosmo. <laughs> Well, I'd like to thank, first of all, Don Lopez and, of course, uh, every one of you for, uh, for coming on this uh, uh, otherwise important day <laughs> to, uh, to, uh, to listen to this lecture. Um, I'm also coming from New Jersey, and I'm happy to say that most of the state is fine <laughs> right now. Um, so, uh, yes, I'm, this is a lecture on the macro mode and perhaps uh, uh, hyper, hyper macro in, in some ways. Um, the study of globalization, uh, as I understand it, uh, is the study of uh, all of those historical uh, trends, events, phenomena that make various regions or peoples or nations in the world more connected and interdependent. This is how I would, call, I would define globalization. Uh, but whenever we speak of globalization, the assumption that the history of humankind is a history of a growing web of connections, networks, transcultural exchanges is only one step away. Um, typical of global history is a focus on migrations, on colonization, on international trade. While uh, globalization is a field of historical research mostly confined to the modern world, and I would say from 1500 onwards, uh, it is by no means limited to it. There is globalization that is growing interconnectedness, according to some, in the ancient world as well. So there are positive aspects in this trend, in the study of globalization. Uh, globalization theories emphasize certain areas and certain processes, in particular peripheries and contact zones uh, that are often overlooked by national histories, uh, looking specifically at China, uh, whereas a national history model stresses continuity, unity, cultural coherence. A global outlook may stress foreign stimuli, cultural as well as political permeability, uh, periods of discontinuity, for instance, foreign rule, and, um, um, and also uh, may help us establish connections between China and other parts of the world. But if a national history, national history paradigm often leads to a certain amount of distortion, <laughs> let's think, for instance, of how often the borders of modern China are superimposed on earlier periods, the globalization paradigm has a clear shortcoming as well. It's a model constructed as a process with a predetermined goal, and no less teleological than the national history model, as it implies a linear progression from a less to a more interconnected world. So uh, if we abandon the teleology of globalization, and the teleology of national history, how can we place China as a unit of world history? It's kind of difficult. Um, so I'm especially interested in the continental side of Chinese history, so the Eurasian side, not so much the maritime history, not because I don't like maritime history, but because the large empires and states created on the Eurasian landmass dominated, for better or worse, much of the flow of people and circulation of 
ideas and technology that to this day influence many of our ideas about China's position in world history. One of them is the history of the Silk Road. Is this one? Yes. Which I use the plural <laughs> as uh, it was understood in the 19th century, Seidenstrassen. Um, so the first part of my talk is about the Silk Road, or roads, in which, uh, in this part of, of the talk, I try to position uh, this concept historically in relation to China. By Silk Road, I mean a series of interconnected routes, which you can see on the map, um, through which goods traveled between China and all the way to South Asia and the Mediterranean, passing through uh, Central Asia. The Silk Road is a concept closely connected to what Andrew Sherratt called the Trans-Eurasian Exchange. Among the many definitions of the Silk Road, we can choose one, uh, and I've selected one by Liu Xinru, who is a scholar who uh, works in America, who has worked extensively on the Silk Road, which um, I'll read it. Uh, the Silk Road was a complex of ancient trade routes linking East Asia with Central Asia, South Asia, uh, and the Mediterranean world. And this network of exchange emerged along the borders between agricultural China and the steppe nomads during the Han Dynasty, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And in the quest for horses, fragrances, spices, gems, glassware, and other exotics from the lands of the West to their West, the Han Empire <coughs> extended its dominion over the oasis around the Taklamakan Desert, that is uh, today Xinjiang and sent silk all the way to the Mediterranean. So this is a very generic, but usually quite common, usually accepted definition of what the Silk Road is. Uh, but is this true? <laughs> uh, if, if, if so, how did this uh, you know, macro system, uh, uh, how did it come about? So um, if we uh, photograph or register, let's say, a situation or a phenomenon in this case, that does not mean that we can explain it um, uh, historically, that is, explain the historical processes behind it. What I'm going to do now is try to sort of unpack, perhaps, this uh, notion of the Silk Road as a globalizing uh, phenomenon and try also to put it in a different uh, um, hopefully more accurate historical context. And I will begin with some material evidence from, for, from an archaeological culture that is quite remote from China. This is the Paziric culture. I'm not sure how to, oops, sorry. I don't have a pointer, maybe there's a pointer, never mind. Uh, anyway, you can probably see it, I can point it out here, Pazirik, um, in, in the middle of the Altai Mountains. Uh, this is a culture dated between the 5th and the 3rd century BC, uh, and it's a Kurgan culture. What's a Kurgan? A Kurgan is a large earth or stone mound with a burial chamber, uh, or more than one underneath at variable depths which also contain, besides the corpse of the person, also a number of funerary objects. This type of culture, the Kurgan culture, this construction of large mounds, has a long history in the steppe region and is associated with mobile pastoral nomadic cultures. In the more, uh, in the sort of third century Paziric uh, Kurgans or burial mounds, we find Chinese silk. We find Chinese silk, and we find a very specific Chinese silk that comes from uh, southern China, or one of the southern states of China, that is the state of Chu. Here, you can see here, this is a map of the warring states. The China, before it was unified during the Qing and An period, was divided into a number of states. And this particular silk has been, uh, has been traced back to Changsha, which was in the area of the Chu state. Uh, but this is not the only thing that we find in this particular burial. We find also uh, textiles that connect this site to the Achaemenid Empire in Persia. So here we have a site with connections, material cultural connections, to both China and Persia. Um, 
So this is a site that is not necessarily connected to trade routes, but it pro probably is the expression of a fairly important nomadic, nomadic culture. One thing that we need to know, uh, to note in the first place when we talk about a nomadic culture of this period is that they have had a long period of evolution and they are usually identified with so-called Scythian uh, uh, cultures of Central Asia, although they go all the way to Siberia, so they are not limited to, to the Black Sea area. And they are dominated by warring, uh, warrior aristocracy, elites. Um, and these, these nomads over this long stretch of uh, uh, time and land, you see this is a map with all these nomads from the Scythians here to the Sarmatians and the Altai culture. These are all connected somehow to a similar uh, 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 material culture in which a particular important place is uh, occupied by gold ornaments by gold ornaments, typically uh, in a uh, uh, zoomorphic or uh, animal, animal style. And um, what um, also emerges through these common features that we find in this culture is that they develop a common sense of value, I would say, uh, symbolic value as well as exchange value. Uh, how do we know this? Because this type of style of very precious, very elite uh, uh, objects uh, are, uh, are uh, spread across all this uh, huge region. And these are beautiful things. I mean, these are uh, highly, highly uh, sophisticated uh, golden uh, uh, objects. We can see this, and uh, this is a belt plaque also found in West Siberia. I'm just giving you a few examples of the kind of objects that I'm talking about. Um, at the same time, uh, China developed a completely different taste or value system based on uh, ritual bronzes, for instance, based on jades, based on silk. There's very little gold in China. So we have a clear separation between these two material cultures and these two value systems. On the one hand, this nomadic world with a lot of gold, and on the other hand, China with a rather different uh, sense of aesthetics, but also sense of value, what was valuable. Um, a typical case, these are again early Scythian uh, plaques, uh, the uh, flying reindeer is a typical motif. Um, one important site in this culture that is, is very close to uh, Paziric, Paziric is here, is Arjan in Tuva, <coughs> uh, to, the east, uh, to the west of Mongolia where in the 7th century they found a burial with a lot of gold, over 2,000 pieces of gold. Uh, and some of them are very sophisticated. Most of them are um, ornaments for clothing, but really quite a lot of them. Uh, <laughs> So uh, gradually, I would say, due to the maybe the ebb and flow of cultural and political connections that develop in various parts of the steppes, a transition emerged from a self-representation of these nomadic elites uh, um, uh, as, uh, as uh, warriors, where they emphasized the sort of military prowess. So there were lots of weapons uh, and uh, horses in the in the tombs and. Uh, um, horse uh, ornaments and so on, to a different type of self-representation where luxury objects predominated. In all of this transition, China doesn't play any role. <laughs> it's an internal evolution of a sense of, uh, of value that develops among these elites, probably so that they could exchange diplomatic relations, gifts you know, over a long distance, uh, and, and also store value. Remember, they don't have land, they have animals. Uh, storing value is a very important thing for them, and gold uh, allows them to do so. Um, but let's go back to what we said before. How do we find, uh, how do we explain the presence of Chinese silk in, uh, in this uh, uh, third century uh, burial? Um, is it simply another uh, evidence of a rare object that entered the nomad sort of value system, another way to store value? Or is it evidence of something else? Now we need to turn to Chinese history. 
and we need to turn to Chinese history. Oh, this is another example of this rather sophisticated gold uh, um, craftsmanship that develops in the steppe region. And this is an example of a mixed, already of a mixed Chinese, perhaps with the jade and gold uh, elements that is found on the border between China and, uh, and the steppes. And this is another very beautiful uh, uh, crown that is found also on the border between China and the steppe in this, but belongs certainly to a nomadic uh, um, uh, region, to a nomadic site. So, um, as I said, let, let's go back for a moment to Chinese history, and in particular to this pre-imperial unification uh, 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 warring states uh, period. Uh, now, we know that China probably had to confront alien uh, foreign enemies uh, coming from the north for several centuries before the Warring States period. However, probably China did not really trade with them. We have not a lot of evidence of trade, of, a, of, of sustained trade going on between China and, uh, and the northern region of China, you know, where these Xunnu people are, where these nomads are, before the fourth, third century BC. Uh, this is at least what I think. That we, we may have sporadic examples, but no, uh, no real attempt by uh, China or by the nomads to acquire, uh, to acquire um, um, goods from, from the other side. So um, something happens in the fifth, fourth, probably fourth century BC. Um, w well, what happens is that um, uh, China made goods enter the nomadic world. Silk, but also, very interestingly, things like this. That is, golden objects which have no circulation in China, basically, no value in China, that enter, but they are made in China. These are certainly made in China because there is also, we cannot see it here, but there are some Chinese characters on the back that indicate the, the weight of the, of the object. And these are typical of a nomadic taste. You, know, you see the animal zoomorphic uh, imagery there. Uh, we have also other things, other plaques, again, made in China. This is a gilt bronze plaque. Um, and, uh, and, and these objects made in China suddenly, in a nomadic taste, enter the steppe region. Um, why? Uh, my um, conclusion, uh, my, my theory, my hypothesis, let's say, is that we need to connect what was going on in China with this increment or increased growth of uh, trading relations with the northern region, with the nomads. What was going on in China is a tremendous increase in warfare. This is what is going on in China. Armies uh, grow exponentially to hundreds of thousands of people, uh, infantries, and also cavalries. They start to have cavalry in China. And uh, what do they need for an army? Well, uh, this is, of course, the terracotta army. They need horses. <laughs> And they need leather for the, for the armor. And they need hides and wool and bones, all the products of a pastoral economy. Uh, not surprisingly, not surprisingly, it is the states to the north of China, Qin and Zhao, that eventually become stronger. The states that have more contacts with pastoral nomads, uh, rather than the states in the, in the, in the south of, of, uh, of China, with fewer connections with the uh, northern nomads. So uh, what I think is that the story that this piece of silk in Pazirik tells us is the following, and that is that around the 4th, 3rd century BC, Chinese states bought heavily into pre-existing nomadic networks of circulation of goods in order to acquire uh, supplies for their armies, and did so with different currencies. What did they use to buy these things? Well, first they tried to imitate uh, nomadic uh, art, gold, gilded uh, plaques. They also sent out mirrors, uh, Chinese bronze mirrors. We will see it in a, 
another one later on. Uh, but these mirrors uh, probably come from Central Asia originally. Uh, the, what becomes a very typical uh, Chinese product uh, has its uh, origin actually in Central Asia, so they already existed there. Um, secondly, they uh, give uh, the nomads something that the nomads started to appreciate, that is silk. <laughs> And probably they appreciated silk because they found that there was a market further west. This I'm not sure um, about. And third, coins. Uh, we find in nomadic sites also a lot of Chinese coins starting from the Han Dynasty onwards. So there is certainly something that the Chinese were buying from these people and they were paying with whatever they could. Um, when the Han Dynasty envoy around uh, 129-8 BC, uh, Zhang Qian, who was an explorer, a spy, uh, returned after 10 years um, uh, in, uh, in the western regions in Xinjiang and uh, uh, presented his report to the Chinese emperor uh, to, to um, explain what, what the strategic uh, situation was among the nomads. He also uh, gave a very detailed description of the, of the, geography, of the geography of the region and, um, uh, and explained also that uh, there was a market for Chinese silk. After that, a lot of envoys actually went to Central Asia carrying silk and carrying gold. Um, so <laughs> what we see here is if I can, if I can uh, uh, re recapitulate my understanding of the formation of this Silk Road, a very long process. First, there is an expansion of nomadic cultures whose elites, the elite, the, the ruling elites, the warrior elites, develop a common value system consisting of precious and rare luxury items. Some of them they produced, some of them were imported which could store value and also uh, have uh, exchange value and, uh, and symbolic value. Um, at this point, Chinese goods such as mirrors and silk, uh, consequently and in parallel with political depend, uh, developments in the steppes, start moving west to enter these this circulation networks of the nomads. So my uh, reformulation of the Silk Road uh, Oops. Uh, Silk Road hypothesis uh, differs somewhat from what I've read before and, uh, and can be summarized uh, as follows. First, the establishment of a system of exchange between China and the West is a long-term result of, uh, of these nomads uh, sharing a, system, uh, a similar value system uh, from China all the way to the Black Sea. Uh, these nomads have a high level of mobility, by the way, political interaction due uh, probably also to war and conquest. Uh, secondly, China engaged nomadic elites in the, in the context of a growing militarization during the Warring States period. The process of integration between a Chinese value system and a nomadic value system so that they could exchange goods among them is based on the historical contingency of the development of large armies during the Warring States period. And three, um, Chinese ascendancy, Chinese political power in the steppe region rises with the Han Dynasty. Um, as, the, as the Han uh, Dynasty uh, here, the Han Empire starts to um, uh, become militarily and politically more powerful than the Shunno Empire, which was a nomadic empire. Um, and at this point, uh, we have yet again a change in the political, in the, in the um, uh, symbolic system of the nomads. We start to find in Shunno tombs in northern, in northern Mongolia, in the, um, uh, uh, incredible things, uh, most of them very much Chinese elite goods. So they replace their own gold objects and so on with a, uh, with a uh, very much a Chinese uh, uh, system of uh, symbolic uh, representation. This is a map of Mongolia with uh, all the uh, elite cemeteries that they've found so far. 
uh, many. And uh, these are the large tombs where their uh, most powerful chieftains were buried. And these are the kind of uh, elite goods, as you can see, all of them Chinese, that are found in these tombs. Chinese mirrors, Chinese silk, Chinese lacquer, Chinese chariots. Um, so this is probably due to the fact that the political power of these people depended also on uh, their relations with China, maybe protection from China, and um, uh, uh, to, in other words, to a change in the political and military balance between China and the nomads. Um, what I skipped before is a Roman glass bowl <laughs> that was also found in northern Mongolia. Uh, Roman glass does not get only to China. It al also gets to the nomads, which explains, again, the, uh, the um, intermediate role probably played by these nomads in uh, this context. This is quite a beautiful Roman glass bowl of the um, first century AD. So, so here we go uh, with uh, Chinese silk found all the way along the Silk Road. This one was found in in uh, Nia, which is around Miran, Lolan, in this area. And a very similar one was also found in Palmyra, all the way to Syria. Um, now, let me go now to the second part of this talk, which is a second moment of globalization. We have talked about a first moment of globalization, trying to, re, uh, uh, try to explain, I I in some ways, the historical processes that, are c that may be found behind the establishment of these long-distance uh, uh, trade routes. And another moment of globalization is the Mongol Empire. Oh, this is my Silk Road hypothesis that probably I've, uh, yes, this is what I've just said before. <laughs> so uh, you can, uh, we can skip it. Um, oh, uh, for, mo <laughs> for, most of, for most of this, uh, of the history of the Silk Road, by the way, I, I like to compare it to a Rube Goldberg machine, where we know the beginning uh, of, a, of, a, of, a, of this machine, and we may know the end of this machine, but we absolutely don't know all that happens in the middle. <laughs> and this is the famous moth killer machine, uh, or moth killing machine. So uh, uh, all these passages in between uh, China and the West very often are totally shrouded in, in, in mystery and cannot be understood uh, based on the documents that we have. I try to have, so we, we need, to, we need to, to, to understand that it's really difficult to uh, uh, establish a, a really, a really accurate uh, uh, transmission history from one point A to point B. So many things can happen in between. Um, and we have to be aware of that. The Mongol Empire, according to a famous theory by uh, a historian, uh, called Janet Abu Lugod, the Mongol Empire created a much more interconnected world than uh, it was before, already in the 13th century. Uh, and this is the kind of, uh, the kind of uh, um, uh, diagram that, sh that, sh that she produced with, uh, uh, as you can see, uh, several circuits all interconnected, <coughs> intersecting uh, each other. I'm mostly concerned with the number three circuit. <laughs> this this one here, uh, wait, oops. Oh. Yes, this one here, f which actually uh, almost connects uh, all of them t together. Um, so while a divided China was reunified under Mongol rule, the position of China in a global perspective remained somewhat peripheral. Uh, at this time, the mechanism of integration, that is uh, what makes a series of segments and a series of areas into a coherent system, is different from that of the Silk Road, but again emerges from very specific historical uh, factors. 
um, that the Eurasian world beyond the Eurasian world beyond the Mediterranean to the east of the, the Mediterranean uh, was fairly well integrated uh, uh, at the end of the 13th century was a fact well known in Europe already. And we know that because of a Florentine businessman called Francesco Balducci Pegolotti who uh, produced a very important book in which he describes all the uh, uh, Asian markets, uh, including uh, currency exchange rates <laughs> and so on, what could be bought, what could be sold. So I information about Asian markets and Asian routes could be already found in the, uh, in the, in the 13th century. Um, however, the historians uh, who have studied the Mongol Empire have especially emphasized uh, who, who have studied this system have emphasized the role of Europeans in this globalizing process. Um, uh, somebody s spoke of the expansion of Europe in this, uh, in this period because of Marco Polo, because of all these people from, from, from the Mediterranean who went to China. Assuming that the point of origin and let's say the creator of this globalizing, uh, globalizing um, stimulus uh, was, was Europe. Um, they created trading work, uh, networks and commercial interests that penetrated Asian markets. But the facts are rather different. <laughs> Um, the creation of colonies or commercial bases that connect the Asian routes to the Mediterranean were opened by Genoa and Venice. I don't know if I have a map here. Yes, on the Black Sea. Yeah, here perhaps. Um, as you can see, this is the Black Sea. Uh, Kaffa, Solkat are Genoese bases. Azak, which was called Tana or Azov, is a Venetian base. And they established colonies there in the early 14th century these uh, uh, Italian city-states, um, thanks, to, thanks to the Mongols. The Mongols uh, issued edicts that allowed them to stay there. Uh, Mongol sovereignty was never disputed, at least until the collapse of the Mongol Empire. Um, both Venice and Genoa uh, had uh, their own uh, diplomatic uh, representatives uh, that provided um, security, uh, legal services, commercial support, and so on. Beyond the Black Sea, however, these European merchants, beyond the, these colonies, had to be entirely on their own. When they wanted to go to China or to Central Asia, they could not count on the support of their own states. There is a clear difference between the sphere of the state and the sphere of the individual, let's say. Uh, individual uh, merchants are, were looking for profit. Uh, in the, uh, states were looking for security, mostly. There was a lot of competition among these uh, city-states in the Mediterranean. They were at war with each other, and they were often blocking uh, trade routes, uh, maritime trade routes, so they had to protect themselves and they did so by establishing their colonies in other places where they could uh, defend themselves more easily. Now, uh, how could Europeans traverse Central Asia and get to China and so on their own? Well, they couldn't. <laughs> they, they just couldn't. They, uh, they, they worked, they, they went to China because they were working for their Mongol, uh, Mongol overlords. There was a system uh, that of, of uh, um, um, cooperation, if you like, but it was not real cooperation, uh, uh, through which the uh, Italian merchants or, or European merchants entered into the service of the Khan or the nob noblemen or the aristocrats and through the permissions and support and protection that they got from these people, they managed to get to China. That's why, for instance, Marco Polo rarely talks about the Chinese. His interaction was entirely with the Mongol aristocracy. And this type of integration between Mongol political elites and, uh, and the European or Central Asian, many of them were actually Islamic merchants, uh, um, uh, basically occurred, uh, happened through two mechanisms. One was the so-called JAM, which or YAM in Turkic, which is a, a, a postal station, a relay station, uh, where you change your horses. Uh, throughout the Mongol Empire, there were these this postal stations um, every 30 miles. So um, 
merchants and, and, and envoys and uh, um, uh, soldiers uh, on a mission could stop, change horses, and continue. But you had to be authorized <laughs> to do so. You couldn't just stop there and ask for, for uh, a couple of fresh horses. Uh, and yeah, this is an example of a medieval, uh, medieval picture of merchants or missionaries. Many were also missionaries and, pap and papal envoys. And you know, if you had one of these things, a paisa, uh, one of these bronze or silver uh, or sometimes even gold uh, um, tablets, you could, uh, that meant you had permission to use these postal uh, uh, stations. The other element that, um, the other uh, institution of the Mongols that allowed merchants to connect with this Mongol elite was the system of the Ochtak. The Ochtak is a means literally association. And it, 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 it implies a particular contract, let's say, between a merchant and, 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 and a Mongol uh, or Turkic uh, aristocrat through which the, the, the merchant takes money as an investment and, uh, and buys things for the Mongol uh, aristocrats. Uh, or um, this, this was used in a number of uh, situations. Let's imagine, for instance, that you need to supply a large city like Karakorum, the capital of the Mongol Empire. Uh, according to Franciscan uh, and Dominican uh, missionaries who went there, they required 500 camel loads of supplies every day. How did they get these supplies <laughs> in the middle of Mongolia? Well, to, through these ortags, through these merchants, who had a special permission, a special um, 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 license, perhaps license is the best term, to uh, work for the Mongols and to supply whatever was needed, whether food or horses or camels or... And um, so these licensed merchants had uh, a special role in the Mongol Empire that made these trade routes uh, very important as an integrating factor, an integrating element that connected all the different parts of the Mongol Empire. And this is, uh, these are two uh, pictures of, um, well, the um, Marco Polo brothers, the father and the uncle of, uh, uh, I mean, the father and the uncle of Marco Polo, uh, with the Great Khan and some uh, probably Central Asian or Muslim merchants with another <laughs> with another Khan. This is a Persian a Persian um, miniature. So, um, I I in in other words, the Mongols created a suitable environment where trade could thrive by eliminating obstacles, reducing risk. At this time, China itself received knowledge about plants, medicines, science. Uh, hunting and venetary matters. Hunting was very important at that time. Uh, and, uh, but the machinery, you know, the, the engine that organized this type of exchange across, across uh, Europe and Central Asia and China was a Mongol or Turkic uh, uh, managed uh, mechanism. The convergence between commercial value system that unified Islamic, Christian, and Mongol, uh, um, um, let's say, commercial uh, environments or spheres of, uh, of, uh, of trade was based on institutions such as the JAM, the postal stations, such as the Ochtak, whose ultimate goal was certainly to guarantee the uh, well-being of the Mongol ruling elites. I mean, they didn't do it for the subjects, they did it mostly for themselves. Uh, but at the same time, it was an empire that wanted to get the best of, the, uh, of, of what was available in the world and managed to find a system through which the goods, goods could circulate. Certainly, the Mongol elites had a very, very important role also in filtering and selecting what was circulating. Not everything was circulating, but, um, th but the system they created uh, finally uh, uh, allowed uh, for a much greater knowledge also of, uh, of, uh, of Asia in, uh, in Europe. Now, as these institutions crumbled together with the end of Mongol rule, the end of the so-called Pax Mongolica, uh, integration, 
um, among all of these areas of the world was lost, and connections became, again, uh, very sporadic, although maritime trade probably intensified after that. So um, I have still, what, three minutes? <laughs> Four minutes? Uh, so I want to conclude with just a couple of uh, uh, a couple of things. And um, um, when we talk about globalization and paradigm, several words happen to uh, um, to be repeated <laughs> quite often. And uh, and these words, in my view, need to be understood. A kind of lexicon of connectivity need to be understood. Uh, better. So I'm just going to list them in the, the few minutes that I have, and just to give you an idea of how I'm thinking about these these words, uh, and then we can discuss it perhaps. The first word is space, of course, space. Now, in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, most people were uh, very, very smitten with the Brodelian uh, notion of uh, a durée, you know, the long duration, uh, which was uh, the environment, uh, economic adaptations, the middle durations, institutions, uh, social structures, the short durations, which was events, you know, what happened. Nowadays, because of world system theory, because of globalization theory, um, world history, a new tripartite division has emerged as a, a powerful analytical approach. People have, have, are buying into this sort of big time. And uh, that is the space analysis based on connections between a local level, a regional level, and a world level, so a global level. Um, um, by space, we, of course, we should understand not a specific city or town and so on, but usually a space a, across which things move. People move, ideas move, goods move. So land is one space, a uh, body of water, a sea is an, an, another space. And movement can be different <laughs> depending on the type of space that we are talking about. The steppes of Central Asia have often been compared to oceans across which people moved swiftly. Uh, uh, because they didn't have to negotiate natural barriers. But uh, if we look at, for instance, climate change studies, we know that this was not the case. Sometimes the steps were more lush, and they had more grass, and they could be crossed by more people, and sometimes they weren't. There was more desert, more uh, aridity, and so on. So we have to be uh, mindful of the historical conditions in which we are talking about. Not the steps cannot be traversed all the time in the same way. Technology also, of course, makes a difference. Second word is mobility. Well, of course, by mobility I mean a whole series of phenomena that describe the human agency across space. Migration, long-term uh, long population movements, colonization, settlements, um, but also uh, diffusion in the sense of the m movement of, uh, of, uh, of cultural features. Uh, there are theories of mobility based on push and pull factors. You know, people are pushed to move or pulled. Uh, social collapse, environmental catastrophe, wars, etc. cetera. Um, they attempt to explain large scale or even not so large scale demographic shifts, but these should not be confused with the mobility of the nomads, for instance. Nomads move in a set cycle, in an annual cycle, cycle pastoral, uh, pastoral um, activity or the mobility of merchants. Merchants go and come, go and come as long as they can. So there is an iteration value. So mobility can come again in different ways, and we need to, again, be mindful about what is moving and, and how, and, and uh, networks is another important word. Uh, much theoretical work has been done by political scientists, sociologists, historians on networks. And a network usually connects several communities, but we can also have networks within a single community. Networks based on religious communities can link individuals, monasteries, sites of cult, etc., courts. Between the 4th and the 8th century AD, the Sogdian community, this is a, a Central Asian people, the Sogdian, had a very strong presence in China and connected China with Central Asian trading networks. We have not talked about them because that would have been too much, but they are important. Uh, networks are historical products as well. They don't just exist. And what I find it um, uh, uh, imp an important distinction is between the theoretical networks, you know, a lot of the political scientists create 
networks that are very nice theoretical uh, uh, um, construction. But actually, historical networks are kind of different. <laughs> they have to be built through specific uh, uh, reference to, uh, to evidence, documentary evidence, material evidence. Transmission is, uh, and I only have another one after that, <laughs> Is, is another important word that refers to processes of selection and reception. I just mentioned them before. You know, the Mongols filtered th things through. You know, not everything came through. So um, let's think of the, uh, the transmission of books, of, uh, of uh, luxury goods, or even simple tools. They traveled between places and uh, whose people knew, appreciated, coveted, and could pay for them. They didn't travel just uh, randomly. <laughs> um, the simple co concept, uh, the simple concept, I mean, that we have to look at transmission between uh, peoples who really appreciated and knew what to do with things probably accounts for 90% of all of the Eurasian transmission. Uh, court cultures in, the, in this transmission are, are particularly important in the pre-modern period because um, they tend to be more similar to each other. Uh, court cultures, uh, elite people tend to share more than common people. And so uh, they also have more money to invest. And so circulation of goods at that level is probably faster and has great broader range than circulation of goods at the lower so the, the common uh, commoners uh, or uh, uh, non-elite levels. And finally, communication. Knowledge is produced through communication. Courts, again, were places that together with very other few institutions, like monasteries perhaps, uh, were in a position to collect and organize knowledge. Uh, but there are many aspects to communication. One of them is language. When the, this, this European uh, missionaries, Franciscans and Dominicans in the 13th century traveled to the Mongol uh, Empire, um, the single greatest problem was communication. They didn't know Mongol. And um, they tried Latin, but it didn't work. And uh, uh, because, I mean, they, they came from a world where Latin was the lingua franca. And they went to Mongolia, where uh, Turkic or Persian might have been the lingua franca. They didn't know. The Jesuits later on who went to, to China uh, learned about, learned the lesson and learned Chinese. Um, so people who moved in between communities, such as the Sogdians uh, in Central Asia, usually knew many languages. And then this multilingualism brings up another problem, which is that of identity and and perhaps ethnicity. We have lots and lots of names of peoples in this historical sources. Who were these people? You know, how did they, how did they uh, represent themselves? Probably they had different strategies. So uh, these are just five terms that are problematic when we talk about globalization. But there are more. <laughs> Exchange, frontiers, boundaries, ethnicity, and so on. Um, so in order to understand how Eurasia, and in fact the whole world became interconnected, we need to pay attention to these things. The ebb and flow of different levels of intensity of connectivity and integration in the pre-modern world, I think requires a deeper level of analysis than that provided by theories of uh, globalization or world system theory. Globalizing forces are not what moved the world before the modern period, for sure. I'm not getting into the modern period uh, after 1500 so much. Uh, but political cultures, historical contexts, value systems, strategic interests, the exploitation of commercial opportunities wherever they appeared, came together in various and very um, sometimes unexpected historical configurations that shaped at different times, in different ways, Eurasian uh, interaction. In some of these uh, configurations, China was an active participant. In others, it was a periphery with relatively little agency. Neither Western-centered nor Chinese-centered narrative are sufficient to tell us what China's place in the world was. And I do not wish to replace either a China-centered or a Western-centered perspective with a Central Asian-centered or Inner Asian-centered perspective, not yet. Uh, <laughs> um, 
But uh, I think the political culture of these people in the middle is certainly very important. Um, so in conclusion, really in conclusion, it may be that in order to understand China's position in the world uh, and in world history, we need, first of all, to understand how these people, whether they formed networks or empires, defined the space around China. Thank you. Thank you.